As you know, the Candidate Group loves to do seminars, and we'd like to get your input on what you would like to see on the show. We are introducing right now Tim Lappin, who is a presenter for Prop 60 and 90 and 105 on transferring your low tax base to your next purchase if you're 55 years and older. And Tim is an accomplished attorney and a family law practitioner who actually has assembled a huge group of experts in all the fine details of family law. And he is going to talk to us in this presentation about the prop propositions 60, 90, and 105. Here's Tim. And I really welcome you all here, and we've got a fabulous program for you. The, this, uh, I'm going to give a little introduction of how I met Tim, our presenter tonight, uh, and why I wanted to give this seminar. As you probably recognize, now, the reason for this seminar is that the tax advantages for us in California especially are just going down, down, down. It's so difficult to, to, to have any advantage from a tax standpoint. So we do have a couple things left. One is, if you happen to be 55 and over, is Prop 60, 90, 105, that's all one proposition, they, they kept amending it. And we were hoping for five, but we lost. Maybe next time, I'm sure they'll keep bringing it up. I'm, don't you think? If they bring it up once, we just gotta get behind it better. I don't feel like, there were so many other things going on, I don't feel like they ha we had enough people behind it. But I do feel like at some point we will get a Prop 5 type uh, legislation passed, which would be very beneficial. Uh, and, and then, of course, we have 1031 exchanges, and I'm doing a seminar on that tomorrow because that's really, these two are only advantages that we have left, and so that's the reason I'm doing the, the presentations. The reason I'm doing with Tim, and we're now kind of a team on this, this is our second one, is that I was introduced to Tim by a longtime friend, mutual friend of ours, who um, was with actually Northern Trust, and I knew her from when our kids went to St. Margaret's together. So I've known her forever, and she was very high up in, in Northern Trust, and she since retired. But I think on her last day at work, she introduced me to Tim and then left. And so we had a nice Her little, you heard right, yeah, she, it's all she had to do was introduce us. And so we, we started this mutual admiration type uh, and respect uh, relationship. And then I asked him, I really want to give a seminar on Prop 60, 90, and 105. Well, I didn't know about 105, so I lied. Prop 60 and 90. And... I, I needed a presenter, and when he talks to you about his business, you'll know why I asked him. But the funny thing is, I'm also a CFP, and there are 500 people who meet once a quarterly for the CFP, uh, these quarterly meetings, and I emailed every one of those people, and there wasn't one person who could help me with presenting on this subject matter, and it was mind-boggling to me. So I was your 501st choice. Yeah, no, no, my first was just, I was, I was out touching, <laughs> and, and I didn't, didn't see, I got one guy, but he didn't know it. He said, oh, I could learn about that. <laughs> I went, no, I don't, I don't think that works, right? So anyway, with, I, I have a great deal of respect for Tim. He started um, what was, at your time, new. Now a lot of people are copying you, but it was new then. And, it, and he's going to tell you about how he has grouped. Well, let me let okay. Tim 
Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Well, on behalf of the 500 other people who didn't come, I'm happy to be here. <laughs> the, uh, so I'm an attorney. I know it's a shocker. I don't dress like an attorney. I don't look like an attorney, but I am an attorney. Uh, and I'm a usual, an unusual attorney because I, I love what I do. And I've loved what I've done for the last 43 years of doing this. So I'm a really lucky person as well. It's, I, I don't tell clients this, but I would actually do it for free if they didn't pay me because it's, it's really a lot. It's interesting. It's challenging. Yeah, I like helping people. So I started this practice uh, in 1975. And in 1988, I was introduced to a very wealthy family that needed some help. And like many people, I kind of assumed that this person's a billionaire and must have like the best lawyers and the best accountants and the best financial advisors. Some of the people on his team were awful. But he didn't know that because it's really hard to tell. You can't, like when you go to your doctor, you don't say, okay, explain Billy Rubin to me and tell me why if you have a high EPGOT, it's a good thing to have. And it, you, know, you don't ask questions like that that would really tell you if the person knew anything. So you look on the wall, he's got a sheepskin, maybe it's accurate, maybe it's a fake, but whatever, you, you go with it. But most of us pick people based upon our perceptions of them, and that happens usually to be a nice person, know them at the club or at the church or synagogue or someplace where you know them socially. So you don't really know much about people. And then you don't know what they know and what they don't know. And lawyers are pretty good at saying, oh, I can do that. So like the guy who said to Leanne, I'll learn that, I'll help you. And, of course, the client doesn't know that the person maybe is a page ahead of the client in the book learning something, and then it's not so great. So I decided to create a practice which wasn't all that groundbreaking because that was my grandfather's practice in Des Moines, Iowa in 1910 to 1940 or 50, which was he'd be your lawyer and he'd help you buy a business or sue somebody to owe you money or do an estate plan or buy a house. But it became so segmented in, in going forward that lawyers became people who only did real estate, and maybe not even just real estate, they only did leasing or they only did land use and zoning. And I found so many clients were having to hire so many people, it'd be like if you go to get your car fixed, and you gotta take it here to get the oil changed, get spark plugs over here, tires over here, and brakes over here, and you go to this guy, and he says, oh, that guy did the wrong thing, and then you gotta go back over to that guy. So the idea is a comprehensive plan where this practice that is called the family office group, and it's really representing people and whatever they need. And the reason I find that's important is that many times people don't know what they need until they find out the hard way. The hard way is an audit, a lawsuit, sometimes a, an arrest, and sometimes they just find out, oh, I should have done that. You know, the ad where the guy goes, I should have had a V8. It's that kind of thing. You know, I sold my house. I could have saved all this money if I'd only known. So the idea I have is, to let people know before they take action what it is they need to know. And the, the specific group I, I created, which is the brochure that's on your chair, is called the Luxury Home Group. And the reason I call it Luxury Home Group, we probably can't add a lot of value to people who are just buying a condominium and the building because there are not many variables there. But when you start buying homes on single family lots, there's a question sometimes about the boundaries or sometimes about the zoning or how many permits were pulled and were they done properly. And the idea being that we can help people from the beginning to the end of that process on things they didn't even know about. Like they may say, well, why do I need to look at zoning? The house is already built. Well, it may have been built and it's not, it's not permissible and they could come back and say, you've got to change something. Or maybe it's fine, but you think, well, I'll buy it. And then in a few years when they have the money, I'll put a tennis court in and then they find out you're not allowed to build a tennis court there. If you do, it has to be below grade or it has to have no lights because you can't disturb your neighbors. So there are all these things that you should know before you buy. And the idea of this practice is to help people figure out before they buy. So that brings us to tonight. The idea, and you may have seen this on your chairs, about where we're headed. The idea here is the, 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 the goals for tonight. The goals for tonight are to address the issues that we know we want to talk about, the, the propositions that, that Leanne referred to. But it's also to give you value, because you may have questions that aren't on my agenda, and I'm happy to try and answer those, because for one thing, free legal advice is a really cool thing. <laughs> and the other thing is you get your money back if it's bad advice. <laughs> so it's really, you know, you can't lose in that situation. But I find, I actually do feel I have a responsibility to help people, and because I have a license, and I feel I have a responsibility that comes with that license. I also feel like I've spent so many years learning all this stuff, the more people I can share it with, it feels like I've amortized it over a much bigger base. 
I don't feel like I've wasted my time learning things that no one ever needs to know about. So I learn a lot of practical stuff for people. I also know a lot about real estate development uh, firsthand, having done it myself, and about construction. So I'm really, I feel like I have all these tools that I can help people with. So let's talk about uh, a few basic things to be sure we're all on the same page. The, uh, uh, on there I mentioned about gain and basis. So we're not, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on them, but, but just so we're all talking about the same thing. So gain is the difference between what you paid for it and what you sell it for, that differential. You buy a house for a million, you sell it for two million, you have a million dollar gain. But if you buy a house for a million and you do $150,000 worth of improvements, now the gain is the difference between one million, one hundred fifty thousand, and two million. Does that make sense? So now repairs don't cost, don't count for that. It's just purchase, improvement, and that differential between that and the gain is what you end up having to pay tax on, and that's called capital gains tax. So the capital gains tax is on your gain. So then people say, what's your basis? Your basis is what you paid for something and what the cost of improvements were. So no matter how long you own a house, if you do improvements, you should keep track of your paperwork so that you know that you paid a million and you have proof that you put 150,000 in so that if you do get audited, or even if you don't get audited, you have to do a tax return 15 or 20 years later, you have to have some idea of how much money you put into the house. So that's where basis comes in. So your basis is adjusted based upon improvements. So then you say, well, how are property taxes determined? Property taxes since the late 70s are governed by what was called Proposition 13. And Prop 13 said you can only charge people 1% of the purchase price plus whatever the assessments are. I'll get to assessments in a minute. <clears throat> so the purchase price wasn't the only factor they would use, however. So if I sold my house to a friend and I gave him a discount and it was a million dollar house and he bought it for 900,000, they're not stuck with the 900,000 price to figure my taxes. The, the assessor has the ability to come and say, it was worth a million when you bought it, we're gonna do taxes based on 1% of a million. Prop 13 also says that you can only be raised 2% per year going forward. So there's a limit to how much your property taxes can go up. And the reason was in the 70s, and the prices were much lower at the time, you would find people who had bought houses in the 30s or 40s, and they may have paid $8,000 or $15,000, and their property taxes are getting to be $2,000 a month, and it was a high proportion of the cost of the house, and so seniors couldn't afford it. So they said Prop 13 would, would knock it back to the date that, uh, I think it was 1975 date, but it was a, a 70s date, and it could only go up 2% per year. So the people said, that was great. What, can, what else can go on that? And I mentioned assessments. So you may know, that you may have seen on your tax bill, if they do decide to put street lights on your neighborhood, in your neighborhood, they might ask the people to vote on it. And if enough people in the neighborhood say, we want it, then that means they agree to put a percentage every month on your bill. So twice a year, you'll be paying a portion of the cost of those improvements. It could be a sewer district, it could be other things. All the propositions that people vote for or vote against have a component to pay for them, and many of those are put on the property tax bills. All right, so that's why property taxes aren't 1% of a purchase price. They really tend to be more like one and a quarter percent, but it depends upon where they are because it depends on what kinds of assessments and additions there are that go on them. So it's an assessed valuation, which is frequently the same as the purchase price. And when you pull a permit to do work on your house to make improvements, they will add the cost of those improvements as well, because that's a part of what Prop 13 allows. So that's the dance that people do. They put a $400,000 improvement, and they say to the assessor, it costs 50 cents. And they do what they can, they not pay taxes, and there's a back and forth. But that's what the game is they're trying to look for. And of course, it wouldn't be the first time someone did improvements and didn't even pull a permit. And, and you, I presume many of you are a real estate agents, you know what a he headache that can be when someone goes to sell a house and he can't find a permit for the improvements. Uh, and the county, or the, I'm sorry, the inspectors can come in and they can actually ask you to demolish it to the point where they can see if it was done properly. And they're not trying to be hard-nosed about it necessarily, but they want to be sure that the wiring was done in the wall properly and the plumbing was done properly. 
because things can be done badly and they can actually catch fire or collapse and so it's, it's important to know. You've seen decks periodically collapse on houses because it's structural, it has to be done by someone who knows what he or she's doing, not just because they just decided to do it. So the idea of a permit isn't just to charge you money, it's to be sure it's done properly. But that's another way you can actually have um, your property taxes go up. So when it comes, uh, Leanne was referring earlier to things that diminishing the values of, of deductions and things like that. There's sort of a truism in the world. Governments are gonna need more money next year than they needed this year. And the year after that, they'll need more than that, and they'll need more than that. And sometimes someone will come in and clean house. Usually someone comes in and promises to clean house and then makes it dirtier than it was before he got there. So it's not, it doesn't always work very well. So taxes tend to go up. Benefits tend to go down because the benefit generally translates to them not collecting taxes. So if they give you a break on something, that means you're not paying as much tax as you would have had before the break, which means they have less money. So cities are getting much less money than they used to because Prop 13 doesn't give them enough money it, because it keeps the property taxes down. They're not making as much money. Every once in a while, someone will do a study in a city that says, if all these properties were assessed at their today value, what would the property taxes be? And it's five or 10 times higher because people aren't moving, partly because they don't want to pay higher taxes. So that's uh, the general rule in transactions is if something goes from one person to another, there's a government in between collecting a tax of some kind. So there's a capital gains tax or a transfer tax or a documentary tax or all of the above. So you can't say I'm not taxed unless they tell me. You basically have to assume I'm going to get taxed unless I can find an exemption from that tax. And that's where we uh, talk about a few of the things you probably know about. Some of you have done this a long time. Louis-Anne mentioned the 1031 exchange. That's one where it says if you exchange a, an investment property for another investment property, even though you paid this and sold it for that, if you transfer it within certain requirements to the next property, the taxes abate it baited until later, right? There's no current tax paid. It used to be something called 1034 exchange. If you sold your house, you could roll the price of your old house into your new house and not pay tax. That got done away with. Instead, they gave something that makes sense in most of the world and not in California, which is $250,000 of a gain per person is excluded from tax. That's the capital gains tax. So if I were to sell this million dollar house for two million, I'd have a one million dollar gain. But if it, my, my wife and I both lived there for at least two of the last five years as our principal residence, 500,000 is exempt from tax. So there's only tax on 250,000. This is, this is really a, not a first world problem. This is a California problem. In most of the country, the exemption is more than the house is worth. <clears throat> they don't have <clears throat> Pardon me, they don't have to worry about a $250,000 gain deduction. They'd like to get $250,000 for their house. <laughs> right. so. Only in California. That's what I say. Yeah, California, some in Miami, some in, and, I mean, in Florida, parts of New York, right. Greenwich, Connecticut. But and that's where you look at. And that's sort of, if you look at the map about where the election money goes, you'll find that typically the wealthy states are the ones that have this kind of problem because the housing is so expensive. So the... Um, Tim, sorry, yes. So what you're saying is, obviously, if you're uh, married, you have a federal home, you're saying that's not true for the state. Right, it's not a state, it's for federal. I'm not, I actually didn't look that up. I don't recall offhand if there's a state exemption but the federal exemption is 250,000 per person and up to 500, but you have to have been there for two of the last five years and you can do it again and again and again. There's no, it's not a one-time deal. So you can keep chasing that 500,000 per couple as long as you live there for at least two years. So when you sell your house and you get capital gains on that for the state, you're paying the franchise board the full vote because there's no deduction. Well, as I said, I didn't look that up before tonight, so I don't know, because that wasn't, my topic was really a proposition, so I was trying to give a background, but in any event, uh, if you like, any question that I can answer, I'm happy to take your information, or you have mine, you can email me, and I'll have, I can look it up very easily, I just don't know. I, when, before I went to law school, I thought, when you came out of law school, you just knew all the answers. 
right? Like the white zones for loading and unloading only, <laughs> you know what I mean? School zones, 25 miles an hour. And it really, it, you don't learn a lot of the details like that in law school. You learn where to find them, where, how to look them up. And so uh, if that's not a good answer, I don't know what I can tell you. <laughs> that sounded like a good cover, didn't it? So the, uh, the long-term capital gains is about 20% for people who make over 479,000 a year. And so in California's tax is 13.3%. So it's expensive to pay capital gains. And that's why people you know may have said, South Dakota, here I come, or Nevada, here I come. When I've had clients, I've had a number of clients who said, what do you think about living in South Dakota? And I said, I don't know, go there in January and call me. <laughs> because you pay a lot of money to be in California, and I think it's worth it, but not everybody does. Uh, many people who don't think it is leave, and then they thought it was, and they came back, because there is definitely a tax to live here. It's like supply and demand and anything else. I'm not trying to, to speak ill of North Shore Lake Tahoe. It's a lovely place. But there are a lot of very wealthy entertainers who can actually pick where they live and treat that as their tax domicile. So states are very, very specific. In today's world especially, they will look at your credit card receipts and your, and your mobile phone records to find out if you've been here. If you've been here over six months in a day, the odds of you not being a California resident are close to zero. Because otherwise, everybody play that game. And they'd say, well, I pretend that I'm not here and I won't buy anything when I'm here and I'll have my kids pay for everything or whatever. And I think, first, good luck getting away. And second of all, that's called a felony and it may not be a good plan. You know? <laughs> so the, the, that's the problem. So that, the tax, tax avoidance isn't so great. But California does have a high tax, and those of us here either think it makes sense or we, we're planning to leave, but in any event, that's, that, that California does cost money. So I said anything that happens is gonna cost you money when it gets transferred. And what happens about the property taxes is an interesting question. So let's assume that I'm one of those people who paid $10,000 for my house, and now it's worth a million because that's the starter price anymore. And so let's assume that I end up paying that kind of money, or better yet, how about if my parents did that and then they died and left me the house? So if they left me the house, there's something called a step up in basis. Remember we talked about where basis was the million or a million 125? Well, if somebody dies, they evaluate the value of that person's estate and that person's estate pays estate taxes, estate taxes. It's, a Cal it's not a California tax. It's an estate from the federal government tax. It's about 40%, so it's fairly substantial. But two things. One, there's no California estate tax. Second, the federal tax gives you the first $11,200,000 for free. So a couple can die with $22,400,000 before there's any estate tax. Again, we're talking about people, this is not a thing that everybody is, hap is worried about. I want, to, I, want, I want to bump up against that 22 million because I'm not <laughs> paying tax. So that's why I spend a lot to try and keep it just below 22 million. <laughs> but you know, the fact is it's pretty remarkable when you think about it because every year the pro uh, of all the deaths that happen in this country, there may, there's probably only 15,000 people, which sounds like a lot, but of all the people who died, only about 15,000 if they even file an estate tax return. Because very few people get up in that number. It's a remarkable number in the political environment where tax the rich, tax the rich is a real big statement. And there are so few people who could vote against it, but it shows you how donations to campaigns can really make a difference. Because how you get $22 million for free, this is not saving ma and pa kettle. This isn't saving the family farm. This is for billionaires. I mean, it's an amazing amount of money. I don't think it'll last. It, it, get, it was changed for a long time. It was a million. It started moving up, then it went to five million, and then it jumped to, to 11.2 million. I would say the odds of that changing again in two years are really high because it'd be an easy piece of fruit to pick if you're a politician. Who, who, nobody can really, with a straight face, say that that's a reasonable amount of an exemption. But Use it while you can, and if you have that prototypical $8,000 house that sells for a million and your parents die, their estate will have no tax because they're worth less than $22 million. And the person who gets it, gets it at 
today's value. So the basis gets adjusted up to the date of death valuation. If the person then turns around and sells that house for a million dollars, no capital gains, because the basis is stepped up. That's what the step up in basis means. Is this making sense so far? Is there yeah. anything? And so I hate to say, the so the, the what's that? Is the property tax stepped up? I'm not talking about this property tax for a minute. No. But uh, so the, I don't like a plan that's really good if, you, if you're dead, because that's a very expensive plan to implement, right? You have to die in order to have it work. But if you're going to die anyhow, it's nice for your heirs to have a piece of property that didn't cost them anything, and they can sell that day f without any tax on the estate or any tax on the sale of the house. Okay. So now, Leanne asks, what about property taxes? This is another thing that's not going to last. You heard it here first. It's going to disappear for sure. Right now, when you die, you can leave your primary residence in California to your family without any step up in property taxes. They inherit your property taxes. And there's, there was a paper, an article in the Times about a month ago about how horrible this rule is. It makes no sense because it's only for wealthy people, which of course is the definition of not making sense to a person who's not wealthy, is it's for only for wealthy people. But it's only for homeowners to begin with, and it's for homeowners who care, are the ones who have a lot of money. It was meant to be so that when mom and pa Kettle died, then little Jimmy could have the house to live in. He wouldn't have to pay a fortune in property taxes. But the reality is, and they mentioned Bo and Jeff Bridges, they get, they get vilified in this article. When Lloyd and his wife died, they left the boys the house in Malibu that's worth $20 million or whatever. And they pay like $1.95 a year in property taxes because they owned it forever. And the kids rent it out for $25,000 or $30,000 a week. And they pay almost no property taxes. And so, like, why does that make sense theoretically? I mean, it depend, maybe politics feel one way or the other. I just don't think it makes any sense. If you're trying to get money for government to, to run operations, why give wealthy renters' kids, uh, landlord kids, money? That just seems weird to me. So I don't think it'll last. And it's being criticized in the press now, which is a, sort of the first step of things disappearing. What they probably should do, in my opinion, is say, one, if, you, if your parent dies and you inherit the house, you got to live in it in order to get the benefit. And, and there'll be a trick for that somebody will figure out, but you got to live in it for a year or two or five or whatever. So there's got to be something like that. Or you can do it as long as the house is worth no more than the median house in California. You can't pass a $30 million mansion onto your kids. But in answer to your question, if it's under $22,400,000, and, and so there's no estate tax, and it's your primary residence, then it goes to your kids, if you leave your house to your kids, I'm saying. <clears throat> if you don't leave it to your kids, they sell it, and the new buyer has to pay the tax. But if they keep it, <clears throat> pardon me, there's no step up in property tax either. So that's kind of interesting. In addition to that, when you die, you get another million dollars worth of real estate property tax you can move over. So that means, so if my parents left me I uh, pick a number, a $15 million house and $5 million worth of real estate. What I would do with that $5 million worth of real estate is look to see which one of those properties would have the biggest jump in property taxes. If one were bought last year, the property tax is about the best you're going to do. But if it's something they've owned a long time, they may have a very low property tax. So you're allowed to also transfer $1 million worth of property, regardless of what the property tax was on that property over to your family as well. So your heirs get your principal residence and a million dollars worth of other property. Does that make sense, what we're talking about? So the second, the second category has nothing to do with your house. It means it's a parent, child, or grandparent, grandchild exclusion for leaving things to your heirs. And that second category is if it's real estate, you can transfer it to your heirs for uh, without having the property tax go up on the primary residence and without having to go up on a million dollars worth of other real estate, any kind of real estate, commercial, whatever. I'm busy if it's for me. Okay, so then uh, let's talk about 60 and 90. So Prop 60 and 90 
people said, you know, this is all well and good with Prop 13. We understand everything. Any questions so far about what we talked about before I move into the next section? Okay, so 60 and 90 say, well, let's start with 60 first. 60 says, I understand Prop 13. This is great. And I'm a senior because I got to be at least 55. Only one of the couple has to be 55. If I'm an owner and my spouse and I have lived there and we're, one of us is over 55, then we can take that property tax that we have now and move it with us to another house in the same county as long as we spend the same amount or less than we sell this one for. So let's talk about real world for a minute. So I got to say, let's say I have a million dollar house and my property taxes were, who's good at math? What's 1% of a million dollars? <laughs> All right. So you got a $10,000 property tax, but I sell it for $5 million. So if I then took $5 million and bought a house somewhere, I'd have a $50,000 property tax bill. But no, if I'm 55 or older, or my spouse is 55 or older, and we've lived there for at least two of the last years, this is a one-time deal. You can't keep rolling it like that two fifty five hundred. That one-time deal, 60 says, I can move it to another house, so I spend that $5 million or less, and I got a $10,000 property tax bill over there. That's what Prop 60 says. Same county, any county in California, same county. Right, so I can't move out of the county under Prop 60. Same county, El Dorado, Lassen, wherever you are, same county. Now, 90 came along and said, you know what, we ought to let people move out of the county. Because when you're retiring out of Los Angeles, Orange County, San Diego, you can't afford to live there anyhow, even if you buy another house. And a lot of people don't want to retire in the city, they want to go to the mountains. So let's have a deal where counties can work it out and they say, if you leave this county and come to our county, you can come and we'll give you the same tax break. You can bring your taxes with you. That, that same thing with that $10,000 comes with me when I go up there and buy a $5 million house. Well, first, you can't five a, find a $5 million house in Lassen County, so that would be a challenge. But it's the same price or less. If you pay $2.5 million, you still get a $10,000 property tax. It doesn't get reduced even further from that. But the counties have to agree. It can't be, it's not every county, and in fact, there are only 11 counties that allow that. And it's up for grabs periodically. The last time Leanne and I did this project, uh, El Dorado was about to cancel their reciprocity agreement, and they extended it. Now, why would a county extend it? Because on the one hand, you would think, if I'm San Diego and you're Los Angeles, say, well, as many people leave you, come to me, leave me, and come to you. So it doesn't matter. And we want people to move because when people move, it's good for the economy. Realtors make money, home improvement make money, people spend stuff when they move, so it's good to have movement. And of course, usually when I leave and you leave and we go back and forth, we're not going to the same house, right? So someone's selling this house and someone's selling that house, so there's more activity. But the other reason is that people may not want to move to Lassen or El Dorado or wherever unless they got some kind of break on it. So these counties that are poorer counties decided maybe this makes sense for us to do this. So if we look, I'll, I'll mention the list quickly. You can write it down if you want, but it, it could change. So don't bet on it without looking it up. Right now it's Alameda, which is Oakland and that West East Bay area, Orange County, San Diego, Tuolumne, which is near Yosemite, El Dorado in the gold country, Riverside, San Mateo, Ventura, Los Angeles, San Bernardino, Santa Clara. So it's interesting, who's missing? San Francisco's missing. They said, we don't need your help. You know, you, uh, we're not gonna give anybody a break. You come here, you pay full freight. So that's what, that's what 90 does. So 60 and, sorry, did someone say something? So, so that's, what the, that's, what those, uh, that's what 90 does. It allows you to take your uh, deal with it. Now, you can also, once you get there, and this gets way too complicated, so I, I wouldn't even take notes on it, I'll just, so, just so you're aware of it. When you buy the second house, you can spend money on it, and that's okay. So if I bought that $5 million house, I'm allowed to spend, I think it's 5% if I bought in the first year, if I put money in, or 10% the second year, there's a certain amount I can put in it and I don't blow the election. But once you go past that, it's all or nothing. So if you spend too much, on that other house, you lose that benefit completely. So it's important if this is something you or your clients are gonna do, they have to talk to their lawyer or their accountant before they do it and make sure they got everything really locked down. What can I do? When can I do it? Because remember this is two out of five year business. 
sometimes what people do, they'll have land and someday I'm going to build up in the mountains. And then they sell this house and they move up there. The law actually allows them to then, as long as they finish building that house within two years of when they sell this house, they get to roll it still. So it's kind of interesting. But see, that's a real specific rule. So you'd want to know specifically for your situation, you're probably talking about a half hour or an hour with a legal or accounting work. It's not that complicated if you know the exact facts. But to talk about all the possibilities here would be, with first it wouldn't be that interesting. And second, it probably wouldn't be that helpful because you really need to know your situation as to what you're going to be doing there. So the replacement property can be bought. Uh, What's interesting is that once you use the transfer, let's assume I'm 55, and since I live in LA, my wife's 28. Okay. <laughs> I'm just saying. I mean, not me, but I'm saying. Let's assume. And so uh, if we do this deal, she can never do it again either. Both of us. It doesn't matter. If one person's 55 and you get to do the deal, you both have used your time as a couple. Now, the funny thing is that it's no worse or better benefit if you're by yourself when you're 55. Yes? What if you do it as a married couple and then you get divorced? Use it and you lost it. Sorry. I would say if you're a married couple and get divorced, marry a wealthier person the next time, and then you won't have to worry about it. Um, that's just, just my personal advice. So. Absolutely. What a concept. Did you learn that from your 28-year-old wife? Yeah. <laughs> No, her orthodontist told me. <laughs> yeah, so, so we got this, the, the equal or lesser value. So that $5 million I said I got and took somewhere else, they're going to look at the purchase price and the improvement prices. And so it's important to document and keep track. I mean, wouldn't it be horrible? They audit you and you find out you're $5 over. I mean, maybe you could ask for a dispensation, but, you know, the law is pretty clear that you can't go over. So... And look, if it's, I, what I would say is if, it's, if you move to your new house and, and, more than, and you're there more than two years, then you can improve the hell out of it. And they'll just add, it'll still add to your property tax, but it'll add to that $10,000, right? Because once you're there and you've, it had seasoned in for two years, I wouldn't do it on the anniversary of the second year. I'd wait a month or two after that. But you're allowed to then improve it. And that improvement will have its own 1% plus assessments added on to the 10000 in my example. Okay. Yes. Well, I was reading on the website of the Board of Equalization where they talk about this. And they said that the first year you can get 105%, and the second right. year you can get 110%. Right. But is that not the purchase price or is that the improvement? So they didn't mention improvement. No. The, the, I believe what they're talking about, I think I have the notes on that one exactly. The question was about the. Um, it's on the purchase price, but it's the, it's, the, it's the total price, I should say. It's purchase plus improvements. So it's 105%, then it's 110% if you wait the second year. The theory is that if you bought a house, it'd go up 5% a year. It's, pretty, it's a pretty funny perception, but that's what, the, that's what it's based on. So you can, if you buy this $5 million in the first year, it's a, if you move right away, it's, a mil, it's $5 million, but then it goes up to $5 million and 5% on top of that. And the second year, if you're buying in the second year, it's 5 million plus 10%. But if you buy in the beginning, you can add 5% or 10% worth of improvements to it. So what you're saying is, if you go over, let's say the first year you have 5% improvements, you can never go over improvement? No, what I'm saying is, there are two things that look, they look at. One is, you want to keep that $10,000 example I gave. If you do that, you can't spend too much in the first two years. If you do that, you'll lose it. Right. But you can spend that 5% or 10% over and still keep the 10,000. If you're gonna do more than that, then wait well after the second year, and then they'll keep the 10,000 and then tax you additionally on the money above that that you spent. So you keep the exemption. Right. Okay. Do you have a question? Oh, yes. Me? Yes, you. Okay. <laughs> Um, so can someone go buy a new home first and sell their house within two years? Yes, the, the, as I read it, it says it's two years either side. Okay, like I have a client who bought like 935, but he put 100,000 into it, landscaping and everything, and that's going to take him above what his property's going to sell for. Well, first the question would be, is it an improvement or a repair, no. right? Okay. And so repair I'm guessing by this conversation it's a repair, right? Yes. Right? <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, yeah, if anybody asks. But so, but you know, it's like law is like football or basketball or golf. It doesn't have to make sense. It's just the rule. And I don't mean that as facetiously as it sounded like, but we have a society full of rules and they don't say whatever. No, the rule says this is what you have to do. So if you're going to be doing that, find out exactly what you can do and make sure that you don't run afoul of something where somebody found in Lassen County, they say landscaping is an improvement, period. Then you got to go fight them in court if they don't agree with you. See, the government doesn't litigate like real people litigate. Real people say, what's the cost-benefit analysis? The counties and government officials say, we already got lawyers sitting with nothing to do. We'll just give them this. They'll, they'll sue you. you know, so they'll find out ahead of time. And I would try, although some cities may not be willing to do it, to ask them for a written uh, opinion on what can I do here, what can't I do, as to what the assessor is going to do. But assessors, each county's assessor has something about Prop 60 and Prop 90 on their website. And you can find out very easily from that. The point of this, and the, really the point of my whole law practice is, be aware that you're in an area that has issues. And before you stumble through it and get stuck, find out. Because sometimes ABC, no problem. ACB, you're dead. Then you think, and it, it's the same result. But if you do it this way, it doesn't work. If you do it that way, it's fine. And it's not, it sounds like a loophole. It's not, I don't look at it that way. I look at it, they're rules. You know, so like in basketball, if you're outside the ring, it, you get three points. If you're inside, you don't. It didn't used to be that rule. You could shoot from next door, it didn't matter. It was still two points. <laughs> yeah. So just know what the rules are if you're going to be in this game. So the really critical thing is when you're dealing with a client, for example, if you're a real estate agent, and they say, we're going to sell and move to another county. Say, so, you know, there's an issue about taking property taxes. Take your facts to an advisor and get the knowledge now as to what the deal is. All right? Because there are people, sometimes people say, well, I'm going to do is I'm going to convert my house to a rental property. And then I'm going to do a 1031 exchange. So well, how are you going to buy another house? Well, I'll buy that and I'll rent it for myself or something. You know, they, well, just find out. It just, that may be really cute and clever, and it may not work at all. Okay. So, so it's a one-time deal, and the equal or lesser property, price of the property. Uh, you can't buy two properties and say, well, I bought you know, a $2.5 million and another $2.5 million. You could buy two properties and combine them if they were one parcel. But so that's, now we're getting real specific, right? How many people are gonna do that? Well, somebody will. Someone in this room will probably know somebody who does that. So it's good to know. So what's the rule about that? Do I have to get them to combine it before I close escrow? Or how soon does it have to be combined? Do I have to have one APN on my property tax bill? Or can, you know, and then you look at, well, as a real estate lawyer, I'd say, the good news, if you have one APN, maybe you get this benefit. The other, maybe you can never split it again and sell it as two buildable lots. So that may be worse than getting this benefit on property tax. So you got to kind of look at the whole thing. If you want to build, just uh, for your own information, if you have two lots and you combine them, you cannot build across the property line unless they're combined. Right? So you can't put like a pool across the property line. And many places won't let you put a pool on the next door lot unless you have them both tied. Because you have to have a house and the outside structure. So, like I said, there's a rule for everything, things you wouldn't even imagine even exist to have rules about them. And they could be disastrous for a client, so it's really good to know what the deal is. So for example, let's assume that I decide I'm going to be clever and put my house in a limited liability company so I can be sure that if anybody trips and falls, I don't lose my own net worth, it'll just be my company that owns it. Does that work? Well, maybe, maybe not, but it may preclude me from doing any of this property tax stuff because it's for people, it's not for entities, right? So, you know, you think like I saved $1.50, it cost me $100,000 when I saved $1.50, you know? <laughs> so you, you need to find this stuff out before you get too far down the road. The, uh, the original property that you transfer on this Prop 60 and Prop 90 has to be eligible for a homeowner's exemption. And as you might know, that doesn't really add up to a lot on property taxes, but it does give you something, but it, isn't, it, it has to be your principal residence. And there's even a rule, and I, I don't remember the specifics, but there's something about, 
I believe if your kid inherits your property and has low tax and then your kid sells it after living there two years, the kid can take that low tax as well and move it to another county. I'm not positive about that, but I'm pretty sure that's what the rule provides. So, but all these things are so transitory, you can't be sure that they're gonna last because they only make sense for a very small segment of, of society. First, you have to be a homeowner. Yes? Does it matter if you're home to the uh, trust, family trust? It shouldn't. Now, the question is if it's in the family trust. Now, family trust typically would be a living trust. A living trust is the alter ego of a person during the person's lifetime. If you put it in an irrevocable trust, now it's in an entity and it might be a problem. I don't believe there's any problem at all with living trusts. The challenge with a living trust would be when the first person of a couple usually has a living trust, when the first person dies, the living trust becomes irrevocable as to that person's part. So you really want to talk to whoever did your living trusts and ask if that would create a problem. If you don't have someone, you're welcome to send me an email on that and I'll look it up. But I would be surprised because virtually everyone should have his or her real estate in a living trust. Now, you want to talk about living trusts? Can I say one other thing about yeah. that? I see people transferring their, their real estate into uh, and out, out of a living trust in order to get a new loan, they forget to transfer it back into the right. trust and it, ca it could cause them some big problems. Yeah. So you've got to remember if you ever have to transfer your assets out of a living trust just to get a loan and that's when, they, that's when it happens, don't forget to yeah. transfer it back into your that's living a good point. trust. Really so, uh, so let me spend, since I think it'd probably be useful, let me give you f less than five minutes on what living trusts are all about. So when, when people die in America, you would think they would say, well, this guy died, uh, his wife inherits everything, or this gal died, his, her husband inherits everything, or the couple died, the kids inherit everything. But it's not necessarily so. Maybe I don't like my spouse. Maybe I don't like my kids. Uh, if it's community property state, half of it belongs to my spouse, but the other half belongs to me. I can do whatever I want with it. So most people do an estate plan and the, 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 everything's a community and it goes to the, the survivor, last man standing kind of thing. Well, if you don't have a living trust, then you, have, and you either have a will that you've written or you have a will that the state gives you. It's called the law of intestate succession. Intestate means you don't have a will like you don't have a testamentary document. So if you die without a, a will or if you die with a will and that's all, nobody knows for sure what the deal is. So what they say is, hey, you put a notice in the paper, Tim died, come down to the courthouse and we're gonna put all the stuff he owns on a table and you can tell us if you own any of this or if he owed it to you, or if he promised you or anything like that. And then people say, oh yeah, I had a deal with Tim, he owed me 100,000, it was an oral agreement. And the court says, ah, oh, sorry, I don't believe you get out. Or they say, I believe you. Okay, we're gonna hold it. 100,000 is gonna go to this guy. So it's, it's almost like an auction. You know, it's, it's really amazing. It's expensive, it's public. And in the meantime, everything shuts down. So the bank account that the wife or husband, who's now a widow or widower thinks he or she has, goes to the bank, they said, sorry, it's a community bank account. I don't know whose money it is until the court tells me. So go to court and get an order, then I'll give you some money out of the bank. I mean, it's horrible. So there's no reason, if you have more than $50,000 to your name, you should not have just a will. You should have a living trust. What's a living trust? A living trust is like a funnel that takes all your assets and then says, where do they go? So it goes in the living trust and it says, when I die, I want this to go to Billy and he gets it when he's 25. And this one goes to Susie and she can use it for education. And when she's 35, she can use it to buy a business or whatever she wants. It all, whatever I want to do is in that document. The reason that's useful is it's sort of like, think of a living trust like a corporation. When the head of General Motors die, dies, they don't say, well, now what are we going to do? They say, Vice President, take over. Right? It's like a bench in football. A guy gets hurt, they send another guy in. It's not like they go ask permission, can I bring this guy in? No, it's just the rule. You're allowed to bring another person in on the team. Well, a living trust has team members set out, trustee, me when I'm alive, and then I name the next person, usually my spouse, maybe my brother, a buddy, trust company like Northern Trust you mentioned, 
And so all the person has to do is go to the bank and say, hey, this guy died. Here's a, here's a certified death certificate. Here's the living trust. And they say, great, here's the money. I mean, it's like that. Nothing filed, no court, and nothing. It's so simple. So if you know people who own houses that are not in a living trust, they're making a mistake because they're asking for probate. Living trust does not keep you from getting sued, doesn't protect your assets. It's just for when you die. So people say, well, that's great. I'm going to spend all this money so when I'm dead, it's really efficient. Well, that is what it is. So, you know, that's, but that's the deal. Why would you not want to do that? It, it is really no good reason to not have a living trust. I know that's a double negative, but it, there are a lot of good reasons to have a living trust, and there's none that I can think of other than you want to cause pain to your heirs. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, and there are people who do that, believe me. I've had clients who just say, you know what, they were a pain in the ass my whole life. I'm not going to spend money to fix this up. They can sort it out when I'm dead. You know, I mean, Howard Hughes died. They had years of litigation about, hey, well, I got a will. I got a will. I got a will. They all came in to say they had wills, and the judge had to sort it out. So, in any event, does that make sense about living trusts and such? So, if you don't have one, you should have one. If you have clients who buy houses without one, in today's world, like Leanne said, banks will sometimes say, take it out of the living trust. We'll lend you the money. Then you put it back in the living trust. It's really not needed anymore. There are very few banks that still do that. When living trusts first came out and pretty much in the 80s, the banks would say, we don't know what this is. We don't want to lend to an entity and then find out we can't collect. Now most banks don't have any problem at all. But even those who do, so you take it out and you tell escrow, here's the deed that puts it back in. So take it out, record, record the take it out deed, record the new loan, record the put it back in deed. It's, it's really no problem. And if people forget, just put it in later. The document you file with that is called a preliminary change of ownership report. It's called a PCOR. And that says, hey, this is just me. It was me, now it's my living trust, and then it's me, and now it's my living trust. There's no increase in property taxes, no documented transfer taxes. It's all free. It's just paperwork. Yeah? So the in and out is not going to affect the title insurance? Well, that's a good question. The question is, does it affect title insurance? So title insurance says, we guarantee that you own this property subject to zoning law. Because if he didn't say subject to zoning law, he said, great, I'm going to go drill for oil. Well, you're not allowed to drill for oil in your neighborhood, right? You can't dig it up and make a, you know, I'm going to put a river in or something. You, you know, you can't do that. And, and it also says, except for the things that are of record. So there's an easement for the power company. There's a homeowners association. But the title company says, we give you insurance. So now you transfer it to your living trust. You don't own it anymore. So you should ask your title company to transfer it, the insurance, to the living trust. There's no risk to them. But they, what typically what happens is you buy the house in 2015, get title insurance. 2018, you transfer it into your living trust. And you say, move it over. And they say, OK, but we're moving over the 2015 insurance. We're not going to do another title search and figure out what's going on. But we'll give you the same policy you used to have. It's either free or $50. It's very, very minimal. But it brings up another point, which is outside of what we're talking about, but it's still good to know. When you get sued because someone trips and falls, and maybe they fell because there's a root on a tree that belongs to the city in front of your house, they're going to sue the person that owns the house and the person that lives in the house. The person that owns the house is the living trust, and you say, I, I don't worry, I, got, I called my insurance company when I put it in my living trust, and I said, be sure that my Trust is covered. So they put the insurance in the living trust. What happened to me? They got to put both have to be insured. So your property and casualty insurance should name the owner of the house, the living trust, and the occupant of the house, Mr. Or Mrs. or whatever, both. And, it, and, and one more thing on that, there's something called umbrella policy. You may have heard of it, excess limits. Umbrella policy is the name applies. It goes like an umbrella over the insurance you already have. So in California, when you buy a car, you have to have insurance to drive it. And I believe it's 100, 350, meaning 100,000 per person you can injure, 300,000 total people you can injure, $50,000 property damage. Good luck finding a $50,000 car in the parking lot. You hit two cars, you're totally screwed, right? Because nobody has a $50,000 car in nice areas, so you don't have enough insurance. You're already underinsured. <clears throat> it gets even worse. Insurance companies say if you're underinsured, you could have a problem. For example, if your insurance is 
uh, let's say you have a $50,000 insurance policy, but the, 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 the car, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm thinking, let me go back and talk about on real estate, this easier example. Let's say I have a house that's a $2 million house, and I say, you know what, I'm gonna take the risk, I'll never have a complete loss, I'll insure it for a million dollars, I'm gonna insure it for half of the risk because I shouldn't have a problem. So I have a $50,000 fire and I think, I'm good, I have 100,000 insurance. They say, no you don't. You had 50% of the house covered, so we're paying 50% of the fire. Even though I had $100,000 worth of insurance and a $50,000 fire, they said, but the house was a $200,000 house, you had 50% of the house covered, we're paying you 50%. That is, that's how it works. So don't try to be cute by under-insuring something because you figure I won't have that kind of risk. So anyhow, the umbrella policy says if the money, uh, if the insurance on your car and your house isn't high enough, we'll cover you. And that's generally not real expensive because most insurance is in this area, most claims are in this area. But look into it. You can find they could be as low as $1,000 or $1,500 or $2,000. It's definitely worth looking at. But be sure, name the people and entities in your life on your umbrella too, your, your personal names, your spouse's names and your uh, trust name. One question? Yeah. So you're saying I'm going to trust that when you have a homeowner's insurance, you should name, if I live in the house, I should name myself plus yes. the living trust? Because you will be sued and your living trust will be sued. And I, we had a case where the living trust didn't, wasn't named and they said we're not going to cover this insurance claim because the living trust, and they, you know, I mean, Anybody other than a lawyer would say, that doesn't make any sense, right? Because it's like you, the living trust doesn't make breakfast in this house. You know, I mean, you obviously knew I was living here and you knew it was in the name of the living trust. So how could you not insure both? They're very formalistic. So if it doesn't say it, it's not covered. So be sure it says it. So you're basically saying that any type of insurance, whether it's flood, earthquake. Well, flood isn't, it depends on the coverage because if it's only insurance to cover a property, like you have insurance about if a tree falls down and the, and the company will pay to put a new tree up, the person's not going to have a problem. It's when you have damages where a person gets sued because somebody fell or you have a car accident. That's really where you need it for sure. But usually policies are not that specific where sometimes flood is separate from the rest. But if it were me, I wouldn't want to screw around with it. Why not just have it named everywhere? Just, uh, I'd rather, even if they charge me $50 to put it on there, why wouldn't you do it? So, um, how are we doing on time? We're good. Yeah, I think, um, how, how are we doing on topic? <laughs> are you kidding? <laughs> well, let's go back to old England. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Would you ask? If Pop five? Pop yeah. Five would have I know you were for it. We yeah. About it so, amazing. Proposition five was the, the concept was going to be first, it's not fair to say, it, there were several points of the we've been talking about would be addressed in Prop five, uh, Prop, Proposition five. One of them was right now it's use it once and it's done. And the Prop 5, you can keep doing it. Every couple of years, you could do it again and move your property taxes with you. They didn't pass, but that, that was what Prop 5 was going to do. Secondly, right now you have to buy a house of equal or lesser value. They, they will apportion it under Prop 5. So if you buy a house for half value, you pay half the tax. If you buy a house for twice the value, you would pay a lower tax on this part and a higher tax on that part. But you could, it wasn't the same amount or less. You could do anything you want. I believe it was still... Um, one person had to be 55, but it was also any state, any county in the state. It wasn't just specific right. counties. It was, it was and, you know, it, look, realtors <laughs> loved it because it made for more movement. And, and movement's good. Economy to it. Yeah, I, I understand you, but I'm saying that from the average voter standpoint, most people, when they go to vote, are going to say, is this good for me? Does this do me any good? I mean, well, I, I'm never going to own a house. Why would I want to do that? <laughs> So I think it, it, just, it had very little chance of passing for that reason. So the other thing that's interesting is that Prop 13 was really never meant to be a commercial property exemption for office buildings and condominium buildings. And what you'll find 
is that somebody could be in a condominium, and especially in, in very wealthy areas where I moved in, it was 500,000, someone was in last week, and it's uh, four and a half million, and my property tax is like zero compared to that guy. And it, it, there's something that sort of feels inherently unfair just because I got there first, but that is how it works. But on commercial properties, it wasn't as if Ma and Pa Kettle were being you know, thrown out of their high rise that they owned, it made that they had this big commercial building. So Prop 13 allows that to work too. And so what was interesting about Prop 13 is that most commercial buildings aren't owned in the name of anybody in particular. They're, named, they're owned in an entity name. And the law came to say that unless more than 50% of the ownership of the entity that owns it, let's say I have a corporation that owns this big warehouse, and let's say I decide to sell 49% of the stock of the corporation. So ABC Corporation owns the warehouse, and that's my company, and I sell 49% to Leanne, um, there's no reappraisal. That's not considered a transfer. I think, okay, why is that? I mean, well, it's because that's what the law says. But even when you ask the people who drew Pop 13, uh, and Howard Jarvis and the, uh, forget who the other people were who were involved with it, 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 they, that wasn't their intention, uh, to uh, exempt commercial property. So that'll probably be the first one to fall. The state needs money, they're gonna look for something, and people who have leases in these buildings are gonna be looking at their leases. And some of them are gonna say, if you sell the building, then, and the property is taxed, if it's reappraised, you cannot bill me, Mr. Tenant, for that. Others say, if, the, if any expenses go up, common area charges, they're called CAM charges. If those charges go up on the building, I'll pay my share. I have a 12% owner, uh, my, my space in the building is 12%, I'll pay 12% of the increase. Because everyone knows Prop 13 is there, so what could go wrong, right? And it's gonna go wrong, and people are gonna be unhappy, and those who have leases that don't allow it to be passed through are gonna be thrilled. Yeah. Well, you can, but the, you're asking about for Prop 13 purposes. I would be surprised if that would be helpful. Also keep in mind, depends on the kind of corporation. Now we're really off topic, but a, a, a typical corporation has income. So are you gonna pay rent? I mean, so, yeah, well, yes, but then the rent that goes in that corporation stays in there and the corporation pays tax on it. If you wanna get the money out, they can dividend it to you and you can pay tax on the dividend. So roughly that probably wouldn't work, probably not. But uh, also if you're doing it to make sure that Prop 13 doesn't mess you up. So you'd have to, like anything, you have to look at what am I trying to accomplish and what, are the, what is the law of unintended consequences gonna do to me here? Because it may be, this was brilliant for, for issue A, but B clobbers me. So I, I would ask, if you have rental property, in my opinion, it should always be in a, I wouldn't say a corporation, it should be in an LLC or a corporation of some kind. The reason is the law says nobody would start a business if you bet the farm every time you started a business. You know, if I had, if I opened a mailbox, et cetera, and I'm gonna try and make some extra dough, but if it goes badly, I'll have zero net worth. That's a huge risk. So the law decided, you know, it's better to have an entity, and so, but you have to tell the world you're dealing with an entity. That's why the lease would say, Lappin Incorporated, a California corporation. So when the people dealing with you know that they're dealing with the corporation, if there's a problem in a big lawsuit, they can only get money from the corporation and they can't get to my net worth. So rental property is a great thing to put in an entity because you can have a, a, a risk. I'll tell you what can happen, Multifamily, especially, you got a laundry room in the building, there's a fire. I mean, it could be millions and millions of dollars. So does Prop 13 consider LLC a corporation? Is Prop 13? Yeah, no, in terms of a transfer? Absolutely. It is, but keep in mind, LLCs pay gross receipts tax. So regardless of income, they would still pay tax. So you really have to sit down and map out your, your risk and rewards to figure out if it works for you. But yes, when you transfer something that's in an entity and the person wants to buy shares of the entity, which frequently people don't, because if I'm buying your real estate, I can get it analyzed and look to see if there's problems. I can see that the 
HVAC works well, electrical panels up to date and so forth. I don't know what kind of liabilities your corporation has. So I'd much rather buy the real estate, all things equal, because then I know when I'm buying. I don't know when I'm otherwise. Back to the question, back yeah. to the 60 and 90, if, if the property is owned by the entity, uh, because the plan is to, to be rental, or, but, but they end up living in it, how could they get it out of the LLC and then utilize the... the I'm sorry, I, I can only partly hear you and I can only partly understand the question, so could oh. you try me again? I, I was just saying, if, if the property was owned by an LLC, yes. but they, they were living in it as their primary residence, how could they then still utilize 60 and 90 to, to uh, answer it? Is, I'm trying to think that through. I, first, I don't know offhand whether 1690 specifically preclude it, but they probably do because one of the criteria is that it has to be subject to uh, uh, the homestead, you know, the, the, uh, the, 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 um, the, homestead. the homeowner's yeah. exemption, <laughs> which entities wouldn't be entitled to. The other thing is you have to be careful when you put things in and out of corporations because there can be taxes on that. Typically, typically, if the owner before and the owner after is the same, it's not a problem. So when I own a property, as I did, and I put it, a rental property into an LLC and I'm the sole owner of the LLC, no reappraisal, no transfer tax. And so generally the same thing would be coming out. Keep in mind, though, the government wants to know, why did you create this entity? There has to be a business purpose for putting an entity together and having something happen. And so, like the earlier question, if I have an entity that owns this property but it never has any income, after a few years the government's gonna say, that's not really a business. We're not gonna give you any business credits. You're not gonna get depreciation because you have no offsetting income. This was just some way for you to kind of cheat the government. So if you're lucky, they just said, don't do that anymore. If you're unlucky, you go to prisons and then somewhere between those two things is probably what happens, <laughs> but, you know. Yeah. yeah, I would say to clients, you know, my job isn't to be your moral compass. I think that's sort of between you and your God. My job is to point out if the downside involves words like felony, misdemeanor, prison, <laughs> jail, you should be a, pay attention. You know, it's like using the carpool lane. People should probably know the carpool lane is for people or to or murder or you have a sticker. Or if you're one of the 40% that use it who just say the hell with them, use it anyhow, it's a cost mm -hmm. of doing business. They figure, well look, it's, if it's a moving violation or not, I understood it wasn't, I think it's an environmental violation, I don't know for sure. It's 430 bucks or something if you get caught. But I think, you know, if I get caught once a year, it's tolls, you know, 430 bucks. <laughs> and so, that, then, go, then go for it. If they say I get caught twice and I go to prison, well now it's a deterrent. So I'd say the same thing for, for, for businesses. Yes? So if you need to transfer one time over the age of 55, um, from what I understand, you can go up by 10%. So if you sold a house for 2 million, you could buy a house up to 2.2. Yeah, we, we covered that before you got here. So I'm sorry. I'm going to call you out on that one, huh? Just, sorry. This is like school, isn't it? Anything like, if you were here at the beginning, you would have known. <laughs> So yes, if you, in the first year, you're allowed to spend 5% more, in the second year, 10% more, and that, but that's the total price. It's not just the house, it's the improvements as well. So it's important to know a difference between an improvement and a repair. So I, that pretty well covers the 6090 and the other things I wanted to talk Does about. But I'm, Good. Well, you have my information on the back. I think you all got the uh, handout. This handout has my email address at the bottom. And, uh, yeah. I am familiar with Opportunity Zones. <laughs> oh, geez. Who sent you here, anyhow? You, you must be a lawyer at another firm, right? <laughs> all right, so there's a thing called an Opportunity Zone, and the idea is to create more wealth in areas that are, are impoverished. So if you, if a, a in the, in the simplest way, an opportunity zone would say, I'm going to start a fund and I'm going to invest in less fortunate areas that are determined to be opportunity zones. It's not my determination. They have to be government certified opportunity zones. If I start this fund, why, why does that make a difference? Because 
Now Leanne has a business that she sold. It has nothing to do with real estate. It can be real estate, anything. Anything she has capital gains from, she can invest 100% of that money into my opportunity zone. Why would she do that? Because now she has no taxes right away. She doesn't pay in, uh, capital gains on that. And I believe it's eight years, I'm not certain, but it, uh, if she pulls it out in eight years, she'll pay 20% less tax than you would have paid. And all the money she made from my fund is not taxed at all. So it's like huge and you get, there's no limitation. So you could have sold the, uh, the Clippers for $2.1 billion and you, oh, you, you paid the $50,000 for them. You can put all that capital gain in, get a 20% break on it, and all that money you invest with my fund for 10 years, no, no gain, no tax on the gain. I like it. <laughs> The answer is the risk is like any other fund. Sometimes they'll do well and sometimes they'll do badly. Is the fund managed by individual? No, it's, yeah, it's managed. They're being set up now by the Goldman Sachs and JP Morgans of the world. They're putting funds together because this is, this is totally found money. This is another thing that makes virtually no sense because it's like you can put billions of dollars and not pay any tax. It's like when George Steinbrenner died while there was no estate tax. He had a multi-billion dollar estate, zero estate tax. So when you put something in the fund, you actually own stock in that? No, you're, you're a fund member, so it typically would be that you would be, you would be entitled to whatever the fund deal says. I, I haven't looked at any fund deals. I'm not, that, I don't know of any that are actually operating yet. I don't believe so, no, because they're not real estate oriented per se, they're funds. And so when you put in a million dollars and there's a hundred million in there, you own one one hundredth of the fund. And what is the, what is, what's the asset? The land? They have to invest in something in the opportunity zone and typically that's real estate that they're investing in. But the fund typically would be the owner. I don't believe it's set up as a tenancy in common or a limited partnership. So I don't this, believe so. It, it is, but it, it, you know, at least there, there's an asset behind it. There will be fallout, just like there is in Bitcoin and cannabis. There'll be some businesses that are legitimate and people will make money, and there'll be some that'll be bogus and some will go to hell. I would expect that the ones that are like the Goldman Sachs of the world will, will probably do well, or well enough. Keep in mind, if you're getting a 20% break on your capital gains to begin with, you can lose a lot of money and still be ahead. I don't, I don't know. I don't know if I, they haven't, you know, they have, it was kind of weird. They set this thing up without really telling people what the deal is. They've just issued regulations from the, uh, the tre Treasury Department. So I don't know the answer. It's coming. It's very new. Yeah, it's a really new. You heard it here first. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Yeah. All right. Well, please feel free to, to shoot me an email if there's a question you want answered and if it's, if it's straightforward and I can answer it, I'd be happy to. Okay. I would like to thank Tim for driving all the way down from LA just to do this presentation today, yes? Thank you. And you probably now know why I selected him as one in 500. Yeah. <laughs> well, I came in the carpool lane, but I had a blow up dummy next to me. So that was <laughs> Thanks again, okay, Tim. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Great to see you.